our official book launch for uh, Swords of Lightning. Uh, I would say 21 years ago, it's been been in the works for about 21 years now. It's the culmination of literally and figuratively the next chapter of everyone's life. Yeah, special Operations Forces International Conference, which is the largest special operations conference in the world here in Tampa. So we have a week long of uh, events to attend and launches. I'm excited that uh, we got a great crowd around us. Hey, so uh, my name is Christian Krempel. I want to thank everybody, a lot of friends in here, and uh, honor the uh, Swords of Lightning book launch. Uh, it's been 20 years in the making, I would argue, for, for the team and, and uh, Jim since 2017. So I'm, I'm pleased to be able to do this in our hometown and in, in our backyard uh, during Special Operations Forces International Conference Week and to have such a trusted group of friends around me. So I want to bring up uh, fifth group and uh, former Secretary of Defense, uh, Chris Miller, to come in and say a few words. Uh, get this party going. I'm like, 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 i into a country that hates us, go behind enemy lines, raise forces, an army, and then overthrow the government. Now, some people claim that we've done that before in the past, like in El Salvador, and some people are like, oh, we kind of did that before in uh, Pakistan. We have never done that shit. <laughs> Stuff, excuse me, <laughs> until 2001. And this campaign, this unconventional warfare campaign, that the story has not been told until now. And it will go down in history as the most successful and unprecedented military campaign, I think, in American military history. Mark Robert, it took 20 years, and I think it was right to take that amount of time, because we need to let a lot of that emotion bleed off. A lot, a lot of stories that aren't in this book that will sh save uh, but thank you for finally telling this story that hasn't been effectively told yet. And team, and you guys know this story probably as well as I do, or more so, you know, because of all the things have been put out. But the 12 man uh, Special Forces team goes in uh, shortly after 9 11, links up with the CIA, and then with, uh, and then with uh, the, the partisan forces, building a team of 5,000 Afghans. And to me, the most remarkable part is the three ethnic factions bringing them together, Kichi, Kazara, and Uzbek, bringing them together at a point in time to be able to liberate uh, Missouri Sharif. But you know, we talk about 12 Strong, the Emmy-nominated documentary, A Legion of Brothers, and various books including Last Warlord, The Horse Soldiers, uh, First Victory. So you've had an opportunity to see other people and their perspective on what happened. But uh, this is great, because now they can tell you the real story. So let me introduce the team here real quick. Uh, you've got Mark Boots, the ODA commander. You guys know this, but let me just go through it real quick. You've got Tom Pennington, 
a deputy. Vince Mackle, he was a communications expert, made everything work. Thank you, thank you. And of course, in putting this together, you've got Jim Beffelis. Hey, thank you everybody for uh, coming out. I appreciate it. There is a ton of uh, veterans out here uh, from our special operations community that were all part of that. And uh, I appreciate you coming out here tonight uh, to participate in this. And so I want to thank uh, Chris Miller for coming, Colonel Glenn Thomas, Colonel Robert Schaefer, Colonel Dan Hill, a man I'm looking out through here. Well, so where's he at? Major Joe Garst is over here. And you're going to hear those names again as we go through this. So they, you know, they don't make a movie about special forces too often because we're not Navy SEALs. Uh, but you see, you see how true that is right there. My wife assures me there's a resemblance. We do. It's camera angles. It's a lot. He is not taller than I am. There we go. Lighting, all those other Hollywood things. But it's amazing. All right. So look, everybody in this room remembers that horrific day. Jim touched on it. September 11, 2001. 2,977 American citizens lost their lives, along with international citizens. My teammates and I did not personally know anyone that were killed on the aircraft that were used as weapons flown into those buildings. But I'll tell you, we have been able to meet other people that worked for those airlines that were around that, people that had loved ones lost personally during 9-11. And we were deeply inspired by these stories that came out of American citizens that were faced with horrific choices. And they had mere seconds to decide life or death for themselves or people they knew or did not know sitting across the aisle from them. And I think every one of us in this room can understand that. I want to share with you the guy at the top of that ladder is a Marine veteran, Richie Miller. Richie was a NYPD emergency services unit team leader. He was called into action with his team that day, and in a very spontaneous act, they wanted to put up this flag. On that day, 62 NYPD and Port Authority police officers lost their lives. And in a similar ceremony, hours later, the fire department of New York put up a similar flag in a similar ceremony. Out of respect for the 343 firefighters, 343 of those lost their lives that day. The picture of the firefighters putting up that flag has become the more publicly recognized photo. But I wanted to share this one of the first flag raising that Richie and his teammates did. September 10th, I had just come off of this Special Forces team. That's the two years you're done. We were part of 5th Special Forces Group at Fort Campbell. I had gone half a dozen times into the Middle East with, with Vince and Bob and, and the other guys on that team. That was our focus area. But I moved off of it into a staff position. September 14th, I get a phone call from my team sergeant. He says, return to the team immediately and bring all your gear. My wife was six and a half months pregnant. The moment I got that phone call, we were in a Babies R Us in Nashville, Tennessee. I had two young stepsons that were four and three years old, and my wife was six and a half months pregnant with our first daughter. And she knew what that phone call meant. We finished up our shopping and on that 45 minute drive back to Fort Campbell, we picked out our daughter's name. September 14th, our team was informed that we would be the first 12 man team out of 45 at that point to deploy out for that mission. Everyone in the, this crowd, I bet you know everything you did on the 10th because you remember the 11th. What we did is we actually took Zodiac boats down the river and dropped the team off to do a reconnaissance for a direct action hit. And I remember how cold it was that night and how far we went to drop those guys in off, going down the Cumberland River into Nashville. And then I remember coming back, how bitterly cold it was on those boats. Made our way to a designated point, put the Zodiac boats out, and then we heard the news and knew what was going on. That was the election. And from there, everything started to move fast. It was quick. And on the 12th, that's when we understood that we were going to get a mission. I was supposed to be at an interview with Colonel Bowers, the battalion commander, to be a warrant officer that day. So I had, I had missed all the, uh, all the uh, events 
in the news. So I was standing outside his office that morning, and uh, it was a very, I heard that there was a plane that crashed into the World Trade Center, and I figured it was a, a Cessna or something, small aviation aircraft, but uh, standing outside his office during the hallway, there, uh, I saw the bustle of, of, of people going back and forth. Finally, the exo came out, I don't remember who he was, came out and uh, basically told me uh, it was canceled. And I went back to the team room and got to watch the, the, the aftermath there. And that's when uh, Andy Marshall, who was our, our Intel NCO, uh, I remember his words were, we're going to war boys. And uh, that's what we're doing. That's our team. Average age, 32. Average eight years time in service. 10 out of the 12 married. Nine out of the 10 couples had two or more kids. Five of the guys, including Bob, were already Special Forces combat veterans from the first Gulf War or from uh, Somalia, uh, Bosnia, and Panama. We were considered the old guys, but our mission focus was unconventional warfare, where you work by, with, or through local partners. So we knew pretty much up front, most likely that mission we would get is gonna mean working with local resistance leaders. The funny thing is, is no one knew what garb we needed to wear. So whether they were tossing around, well, you know, they're, they're, they're Russians over there. There's, I, I, you they said, well, and so the, the, the logistics guy, he runs out and he brings this, these clothes back and he goes, here, I think I got the perfect garb for you. And we start putting this stuff on, you know. Everyone's looking at each other going, he can't be serious. So as we begin to laugh, then we go, oh, we've got to take this photo. In case none of us make it, at least they have this photo. The night prior, we had a weather call, so we got uh, delayed by 24 hours. We actually, as a team, watched the DVD of uh, Spies Like Us to prepare us mentally for our mission. We have a special guest here tonight, Major Retired Joe Gars. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Yeah. I am. Joe was the Air Mission Commander uh, for our team's insertion. He flew the three of us that night, as all 12 of us would be in the back of one of those MH-47s, to get us to where we needed to be in northern Afghanistan. So, thank you very much for joining us here tonight, Joe. Joe and his guys did an amazing job of getting us uh, out there. It was a four and a half hour plus, I don't even remember, four and a half hour plus helicopter ride. Uh, did an incredible job, low level, doing an aerial refueling. They told us up front, they're gonna take that helicopter higher than it is supposed to go. They told us straight up, we're going over 10,000 feet for an extended period and there is no oxygen system. So we've been through that, that training as part of our thing, through the altitude chamber. So we knew if that's extended, you're gonna pass out. So literally the 12 of us in the back of that helicopter, like dumbasses, got in knowing we're gonna pass out as they take us over the pass. And we, we all fell asleep, waking up literally 20 minutes before they're gonna to touch us down as we descended through that altitude. We did not wanna go in with one aircraft. We actually wanted to go in with two aircrafts because we wanted to do a split team. Uh, I would take one bird and Mark would take the other bird. And so uh, in case one bird went down, then you have another team that's still able to go in and then do the mission. So they say, well, we only have one bird. So they cram us into this one bird and as they're, as they're looking at this and they're adjusting weight and they're going, man, how, how much weight do each one of you guys have right now? Th this is what I have. I got my, my body armor, my helmet, and they go, oh, Wait a minute, you gotta get rid of some stuff. I said, well, that's easy. I don't want the Kevlar, that's a pain in the ass. So I throw the helmet away. And then we all look at each other and somebody goes, do we really need the vest? And we thought about it and said, you know, not really. And when we hit the ground, we just might build more rapport because we're gonna be just like them. They're not gonna have anybody we're going to hit the ground and fight just like them. And it worked out for us. We knew the brevity of the situation. We were very excited. It's hard not to be. 
going to Afghanistan, you're on the first, one of the first two teams going in. And uh, yeah, it was cold, and we slept a little bit, but I, I can tell you, uh, it's a uh, very exciting times, and it's hard not to, your brain was constantly thinking of what's, what's, what's on the other end of this, and uh, what the next two days are going to entail. Our operations order was literally two pages. Go forth, conduct unconventional warfare, with these guys, you can go anywhere in the country. We want you to go. You're going to work with this CIA team and figure it out. That's pretty much it. We had the unprecedented authority to kill or capture Taliban or Al Qaeda wherever we encountered them. This is General Dustin's first meeting with us as he's got this incredible map. And these are some of the CIA agents that are helping us. Right away, it became a fire hose of information from General Dostum. They told us about the enemy, where they're at, how, what strength they are, what's their capabilities, what their name is. You know, so they, they knew these people and what had happened. Mark had to build a rapport with, uh, with this man that, you know, you guys didn't know anything about him really. Well, yeah, the, the intel that we received prior to going in was that he had diabetes, he walked with a limp, he had a bad leg, um, he, had, uh, he was overweight, he had breathing problems, and we were sitting back going, holy cow, we're going to team up with this guy? And uh, it was nothing like that when we, when we hit the ground. This guy was raring to go, he was uh, all excited, he, uh, he shook our hands and he said, when do you guys want to fight? It, it was that quick. And again, what we told Mark was, look, you're, you're the commander. You need to start, you need to advise him because we're going to start advising the sub-commanders along the way. Forming that connection with this guy uh, was tough. You know, the movie tries to depict that. There were some challenges. He tested us. It wasn't how they depict in the movie. After that first meeting, six of us would ride horses. We didn't know where we were going, how long that was going to be. And... Uh, but he, he would test us because he rode off and left us because uh, to see if we really had the commitment to show up. So this is our force. This is one of the forces uh, on, on light infantry guys, incredibly uh, some uh, brave men, uh, but they had little to nothing supplies. That first day, 300 of them were mounted on horseback. It was incredible to see that uh, as we brought these different factions together. Here's a photo of our team. After several days in battle, Bob and the other half of the team came up to the General Dostum's headquarters. And uh, that's at the point we decided we are splitting three of our guys out. We're giving them our last battery, our last bit of ammo and radio. And we sent those guys away from us. As a leader, this was a very challenging point because I sent them away with 10 guys as Afghans as security on horses. And I did not physically link up with them for 14 days. When they rejoined us at the key battle at the pass, they had 300 Afghans rallied around them. What they did is they gave us time. They bought us time to reposition through the battlefield. And we could then break down even to um, more cells, more three-man cells. Now here we have um, some of the equipment that you used to call in some airstrikes. Now this is the uh, soft land right here. They're able to get in there uh, with accurate uh, airstrikes and uh, keep them from, from reinforcing. That was a, a major uh, uh, change for us and back uh, on the battle here. So what we really did is we started to build momentum. And we, we did something very risky that uh, honestly uh, Colonel Hall and the command would probably have not approved if we had waited for permission. These guys, the guys we're with are our allies. They're outnumbered, outgunned. The best thing they got is a rocket grenade launcher. They're going up against tanks, rocket launchers, and artillery. Incredibly chaotic. Do any of you ride horses in here? So in Afghanistan, if you ride a horse, you ride a stallion. That's their culture. If you've been around horses, when you get more than two horses together, what happens? They're going to fight. They're going to kick. And that became a huge safety factor. The U.S. Army had not ridden horses in combat since 1942. How do you carry a rifle? What gear do you wear? What do you leave behind? What are the tactics that you use when you're riding horses? I'm telling you right now. And riding those things was a chore for everyone. So the whole time we were riding, he was reaching back and trying to bite me. Now, I'm slapping his nose 
and trying to ride at the same time the entire the entire time. So they made great sport and fun about giving us the rankest worst horses. By fate, I grew up on a Kansas cattle ranch, rodeoing through high school in Colorado. It's a thing in the flyover states out there. Uh, but for Bob and Vince, they tell me they had quarter horse training. That's when mom and dad took them to the Walmart or whatever. They rode a little mechanical horse outside. That was it. So the real magic of what our team did with our CIA teammates was we brought four different ethnic factions together to recognize they had more in common except every one of those leaders brought about a hundred of their closest heavily armed friends. It was a little sporty. We were a little worried about that. Bob and I were in the room with the leadership, ready to kill everyone in the room. Thank God nothing happened. The leaders all agreed to cooperate and share information and go forward. And by doing that, that raised up a militia force of nearly 5,000 fighters and we orchestrated an uprising that was to occur a week later across six of the provinces, across six of the states. So up, up right there depicts that very first day when uh, our CIA team and our ODA is working together. Remember how united our country was on September 12, 2001? It didn't matter whether you were a CIA paramilitary officer, a Green Beret sergeant, or, or a special forces captain. It was, these are my permissions, these are my authorities, we are all here. Together, they have attacked the American homeland. In the bottom right, Bob touched earlier, my mission is General Dostum, to build relationships with him. In the upper left, we are watching General Dostum build relationships with these different rival factions and other people from his own ethnic background. Some of them are riding from hundreds of miles away. Pick a moment, let me tell you about the day in the life of the pilots. These Air Force and Naval and Marine Corps pilots had to get gas two or three times to get across the Indian Ocean, get across Pakistan, all the way to northern Afghanistan, precisely employ their ordinance without killing me, our team, or our allies. And then they got to get gassed two or three times more to get back on the back of that boat. Which aircraft do you think was our favorite? The refueling aircraft. That, that B-52 on the top. <laughs> that B-52 on the top could motor for a long period of time. And the payload? We could drop bombs for days. We even got to employ a BLU-82, 15,000 pounds. He said, make some mushroom cloud. They told us it was going to look like a nuclear explosion. I mean, dude, they went through so much trouble. You need to be face down. Uh, you know, it was literally, remember the old hide under the desk? It's going to be a <laughs> nuclear crowd blast. That's what they told us we had to prepare our allies for. And it turned out to be the big fizzle. <laughs> <laughs> So, so they go, hey, give us a target. Really? You want a target? Okay, that's easy. Hit this target right here. Wow. Uh, yeah, American eyes on it. No, but it's a target. It's bad. <laughs> yeah, but how do you know? Because I'm telling you this. Uh, yeah, we can't drop it there. Well, where are you going to drop it? Is there an empty spot in the desert that can just make a big mushroom cloud and maybe scare the crap out of them? I mean, that's on you guys, I don't, I don't really care. And that's exactly what they did. And so we wanted to put it on a enemy command post so that everybody would see it. And then some smart politician folks above us started pushing it further and further and further, further, further away from us. And we never could see the blast. Yeah, it was very bad. And there's the signal to initiate the attack. And it got pushed so far away from us. Yeah. So, but we had a special operations aircraft coming in every night. It wasn't just Joe and the 160th flying in helicopters. We had the Air Force special operations folks flying from eight hours away in Insulik or in, in Uzbekistan. And every night they'd fly in and they'd drop 32 bundles of lethal, non-lethal aid. It, it's not fun if it goes into a river, because then you gotta dig it out. Or if it lands in a minefield, as Vince a little test of that, and we have to go tip, tiptoe through the minefield to pull this, this, all this equipment out that we are much needed. On the drops too, the Air Force had told us before we went in that all they needed was a 10 to grid, and they dropped it within 100 meters of that. And uh, I think that was a rare occasion. <laughs> and then not to mention that we were out fighting our, our supply chain at some point. So we went, but, Three or four days with no resupply as far as foods, so we were eating crackers and jelly packs. 
for three days. Yeah, that was an amazing weight loss program, less than 30 days. Our entire team lost 20 to 25 pounds of body weight. But anyways, that's, that's the Alamo. That's where we landed on the infiltration coming in. And we, that's where we would meet Dustin. Uh, the guy on the left there, that's uh, Willie Boy, or Will Summers. He's part of the organization for Soldier Bourbon. And there's old Mark right there. He's digging into a nice, fresh MRE that he's warmed up by the fire. Vince, you want to talk about this? Vince is on the top there on the left. I am on the bottom left. The, you know what? It actually looks like the Beverly Hillbillies, doesn't it? <laughs> all, I'm, all I'm missing is the rocking chair. How many of you are in shipping or transportation? This is our motor pool. This is our Teamsters. These donkeys then, didn't, uh, you know, they would be converted into the Afghan ambulance and they'd bring a casualty back to a special forces aid station. And uh, several hundred of our allies lost their lives. Several hundred more were injured. Uh, Steve and the medics would uh, patch up and triage those casualties. And every one of us, because of our cross training, got involved in helping uh, triage those casualties. We broke through their defenses and then we had to fight through a battle at a, a key pass, a key terrain that we anticipated they would be at. That's the a photo as you look through the pass, two miles long, a quarter mile wide, and you're attacking along the left side of the water. It drops down 30 feet to that ice cold freezing water. One of our teams, uh, three man team with our team sergeant had leapfrogged ahead of us and they secured the eastern heights of that pass. That's their view from the top of the pass looking down. That's the lower right image. We liberated the main city of mazar -e sharif on November 10th, and the who's who of that community turned out to celebrate the Afghan leaders and to cheer the Americans that were there with them. We no longer needed the horses. Now we finally got the ATVs and the pickup trucks and the four by fours that we acquired off the local economy and we changed to a motorized, mechanized force. Our 3,000 horsemen no longer need those horses. Now they've got Soviet tanks, vehicles, armored personnel carriers. We went from them aerial delivering horse feed to now I need diesel fuel, ammunition that fits these weapon systems, parts, spare tires. These guys did an amazing job, Pete and the other guys, taking these vehicles downtown to a local shop getting them beefed up, getting them inspected from bumper to bumper, because our lives rely on these vehicles. We actually call that our Mad Max phase, mm -hmm. because now we got vehicles, now we could travel fast, now we could cover the desert, uh, we could hit more key terrain. Um, although I would say that at the time that we did do our battles in the valley, nothing could beat the horse. Taking the high ground, calling in close air support, we had the upper hand. Then the kids start showing up, and their parents, and casualties that had been in the hospital, and they came to thank Dr. Steve for saving their life. There's a younger, thinner, fat <laughs> Thor, and Bob. Hey, Bob. Hey, Bob. We finally got called out uh, back to Uzbekistan to meet Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld. Uh, that's our team back in Karnshi Khanabad as uh, we got the honor to brief uh, Secretary Rumsfeld. Our team lost one of our CIA counterparts along the course of that mission. Johnny Michael Spann became known as the first American and was killed on uh, November 25th, 2001 when the Al-Qaeda surrendered. But they faked a surrender basically and then overpowered their Northern Alliance Guard. They were still armed. Towards the end of that deployment, we lost one of our teammates, one of our medics, uh, Bill Bennett, was killed on the September 12th, 2003. What, what I want to let people know about is Bill was one of the three guys that they depict in the movie 12 Strong. That was the first three splitting out. Bill, Andy, and Steve are our heroes. They're the guys that went deep into the enemy rear area for 14 days on their own. They allowed us the time and space to build up the resistance army, arm and equip them, and do what we needed to do. I've gone back several times in uniform with Bill, Bill Nahr. I've gone back as a defense contractor, and uh, I've gone back in uniform doing some private humanitarian efforts. 
Well, General Dostum, depicted there in the green jacket, paid our team this incredible compliment. If I asked for a handful of Americans, and they sent me the strength of an entire nation. That is, that is so humbling. The presence of Americans with our allies is invaluable. I cannot emphasize that enough. We have special forces teams deployed in probably 60 countries tonight, and our special operations teams uh, deployed in a few more. We were asked to bury some pieces of World Trade Center steel around Afghanistan. This print that's behind Vince is one of the few in existence. They are in the NYPD, the Fire Department of New York, the Port Authority, it's in the Pentagon, and it's in the 5th Special Forces Group headquarters. And we have one proudly displayed over here across the river in the Horse Soldier Bourbon uh, team room. Every one of us in this room can understand transitioning to a new job. It is incredibly challenging for veterans, especially our Special Operations veterans that have done so much over the last 20 years for our country. So I'm very proud to kind of transition this discussion to American Freedom Distillery and the Horse Soldier Bourbon team. Being a part of Horse Soldier Bourbon gives us new mission, purpose, and focus. Like learning a new spirits language. Like we didn't know this, we're on the other side of the bar. You know, I've seen bourbon bring people together in Uzbekistan, in Kuwait, in Africa, said we want to be a part of this. Learn that new language, it's a challenge to learn the new language of the spirits industry. We're talking about some things that were terrifying to us as veterans as we transition. But I encourage a lot of veterans to get outside of your comfort zone and learn that new language and find something you're passionate about. And, and I'm so honored and humbled to be a part of Horse Soldier Bourbon. I want to say thank you to Fred and Laura for hosting us in this amazing space. I want to say thank you to Christian Kremple for putting this together here tonight. To share this moment with uh, friends that we served with, people that have been along the journey throughout our life, you know, the last 20 years since, it's been amazing and humbling. I wanted to add about another 20,000 words to it, you know. Uh, I, I'm gonna lay it all out there. I want our families and our teammates to know what these guys on that ODA 595 team went through. Just helping each other bounce back from that. There, there's some frustrating days. It wasn't all sunshine and roses. I will tell you, there were some heated conversations internally. You know, nine out of 12 of our guys were special forces snipers. I can kill that guy today, that key enemy commander. But it's like, that's not our mission. Our mission is to advise and assist and help enable and empower our allies. And yeah, that's a tough balance. Like, that's what they teach us in Special Forces. Look at a problem strategically, find the strength, find the weaknesses, find where you can impact that mission to positive outcomes. There's so many other incredible missions that we hope uh, the light that's been shed on our team will uh, share some of the incredible lessons. And I, and I say that in the presence of my peers, yeah. uh, that there are incredible missions out here yet to be told.